What's up and welcome back to the podcast with no name. The yes, cricket we did podcast not... with no name. <laughs> we got something right. Okay, so yeah, we still didn't get a name somehow. Don't ask me why. But um, apparently it's hard. So um, in today's episode of Cricket Podcast with no name, uh, we will be talking about the World, uh, World Test Championship final and the stats basically comparing everything uh the some of the batsmen and uh the bowlers uh because boy we all know that uh the uh, new zealand bowling and uh india bowling is very similar and they're both amazing as well as the whole rest of the entire team so we in this uh episode we'll be breaking it down and going to every single player stats and at the end we will also see uh, how each batsman has fared against uh, other bowlers right yeah uh, it's it's also an important thing because the uh, world test championship final when you look at the two teams stacked against each other you can really see it's like well deserved because these truly have been the two best teams in the world in this format right now and and now even more, now more so across formats because you have like uh, New Zealand who are right now number one. Uh, they just became number one ranked in the world after their series win against England. And uh, they, they, they're number one in tests. They're number one in ODIs. They're number three in T20s. And then you go to India as well, who's, no, who's now number two in uh, tests. I think they're number three in ODIs or number two in ODIs. And number one in T20s, I believe. So you, you look at the two. Well, I mean, I think... That- I think we're number two. England's number one in T20. Oh, they're still number but, one. Yeah. yeah, that can change. That can change. Uh, but then the, the either way, the best teams across the world and across formats, I believe, are these two teams right now. So it's only fitting that they're playing in such a grand game such as this. Yeah, I mean, this is basically the two best teams that have basically uh, played in this World Test Championship against each other, and that's kind of what a final in any sport or anything is basically so it's i mean it's always going to be interesting uh, so here we are we're going to start with uh comparing uh the first one of the main openers and one of the players who's played amazingly for india uh, rohit sharma and we're going to be comparing him with um tom latham who has also done uh very well in the world test championship right so uh, as as you mentioned these two are uh, even coming into the uh, World Test Championship, Latham has already been an established opener and established as being one of the best openers in the world for a long time, even before the World Test Championship itself. Rohit Sharma, surprisingly enough, is more new to the role as a Test match opener because he has played in the middle order in Test matches a lot. He was promoted to the top order in the limited overs formats back in 2013, and we all know how that ended up. became probably one of the best openers in history, in my opinion. Uh, but then it took a longer while for them to shift to a focus of, okay, maybe he can open in tests as well. There, of course, came its own doubts, uh, such as, hey, can he play the swinging ball? In limited overs matches, the ball doesn't swing and seem as much as you see in test matches. Uh, so how will he handle like a place like England or New Zealand? And so when they promoted him to the opening spot, it was uh, in the home series against South Africa. And... The pitches weren't easy, so we, I wouldn't call them extremely flat pitches because they were very conducive to turn, and if you're, if you're batting first on a first-day pitch, there was some seam, especially in the Pune Test match, if I remember correctly. But he absolutely yeah. dominated the series. He did he had a double century in his, first, uh, in his first game, or first two games as an opener, and he, I mean, he had a century anyway in his first, game, first innings as an opener. Yeah, it was just, yeah, yeah. it was too good. So it, it looked like he belonged to the spot anyway. So even Mayank Agarwal as well. But the real question came when he went to uh, Australia because he went to Australia a bit later because he had an, he was nursing an injury from the IPL. So when he went to Australia, there were their own doubts as, okay, you're facing one of the best pace attacks in the world right now at their home ground. How are you going to hold up to that? Now, of course, there was a counter argument that this is, Austra- this is Australia. You have pace and bounce. And if there's anything Rohit loves, it's pace and bounce. Because we all know he can play the pull shot very well. He, he plays the short ball probably amongst the best players in the world at that. So 
it was only fair that when he went there, he was able to perform well there as well. He had a 50, and he gave decent stats to India whenever he batted. So in that, in that series where every contribution by any player mattered, he delivered. And that was, that was a major confidence booster to not only him, but the team management as a whole in the sense that, hey, this guy can be our test opener across anywhere in the world, regardless of home or away. But the real test now would come in England, where it's a more swing conditions, uh, not so much pace and bounce as there is swing against the best swing attack in the world after England, in my opinion, where you have bold, you have you have uh, Saudi. Well, we'll get to that later. But uh, it's a real test for him. And if he gets past this, I, I'm probably safe to say that he's the best opener in the world right now in tests as well. Yeah, so if we take a quick look at his uh, stats in the World Cup, uh, I mean, World Test Ch- Ch- Championship, you can see that he's done f- amazing. He's he's He just got past 1,000 runs in his pa- uh, last test match, and he's at 1,030 runs right now at an average of 64.37. That, that That's some insane stats, especially for someone who's played 11 matches and 17 innings. Yeah. And now if you compare that to Latham, who is uh and this can be comparable because they've played almost like the exact same amount of matches and innings. Uh, uh Latham has played eleven matches, which is the same as Rohit, and played one more innings, eighteen. Uh, but even though he has got uh six hundred and eighty runs, he still has an average of forty with a strike rate of uh forty six point seven, which still is amazing for someone who has uh. Uh, faced one of the best bowlers and and many teams, yeah, he's done well. Yeah, um, a bit more on Latham here is he's always been uh, so. There's there's a major difference when we talk about Rohit versus Latham. Rohit is a more aggressive opener. So when you think of Rohit, you obviously think of him taking the attack to the opposition and scoring at a much quicker rate than say uh, Pujara or Rahane. Uh, but then when you uh, go to Latham, on the other hand, he's a classical grinding opener. So he will blunt the new ball and he will face as many overs as needed so that the new ball isn't faced by the uh, premier batsmen such as like Kane Williamson or your Ross Taylors or, or something like that. So, but that makes his role extremely challenging in my opinion. Because so he, he played his games at, ho- at home. New Zealand played most of their games at home. For the World Test Championship. And when you look at New Zealand as a place for batting, it has historically been not a good place for batting, especially if you're batting first or batting on the first two days, really. The pitch is almost as green as the outfield and the ball will swing and seem helter skelter. So for an opener to stay in and play like through the first day or through the first two days, like he's done, is, is insane to think about. And there's not many people in the on the planet that can do that of course the the flip side to that is he is uh while he's been great against spin in uh your limited overs cricket where he bats in the middle order in the test in test cricket he's he's not very adept at facing spin so like when he went to uae or uh when he faced spinners even in new uh new zealand or australia he struggled either against the short ball by the pacers or the spin of uh, because every team, whether it's a pace or a friendly or a spin friendly place, plays a spinner usually, uh, and he wasn't used to that. So I guess that could be his own the only chink in his armor there. Yeah, and another thing is you can see that Roth uh, flexible, especially because he uh, if you, I mean not that this is related to World Test Championship, but if you see any other format, you can see that he can go quick. His he, he can go at a strike rate of like what 150, 200, even more, and then he can switch that gear as soon as it comes to test. And if he wants, he can play two hundred balls if he wants and still get a high score and keep you know uh, the batting strong. Uh, that and some people don't see that because people think of him like I like you said people think of him as a hitman and uh, you know they he just hits maybe sometimes he gets out and. But he, in reality, he actually plays well, and he also gets runs. Uh, and his strike, even though his strike rate is like sixty, he still, yeah, he still does uh, what's needed for the team. Yeah, a strike rate of sixty is really good for Test cricket, and it just proves that his role, especially when you strike at sixty as an opener, when it's usually harder to get started against the new ball, 
that proves that, okay, my main job is to take the attack to the opposition. And the, uh, if I score 50 or if I score 75, I do that at a strike rate of 60 or 70, and it gets the team off to a flyer. Okay, now we talked about the openers. Well, one of the openers for the teams. Now let's go to the most important players of both the teams, the captains. Virat Kohli and Kane Williamson. The, these two are being talked about like way more than I can even say. But if you if you if we now look at them, we can see that uh, Kohli has played uh, many more innings than Williamson. However, has still played a key role to uh, lead India to the finals. And you can see that by his stats, which uh, he's played 14 matches, uh, 22 innings, and uh, he scored eight, 877 runs in, uh, at an average of 42.4, which is very good uh, considering that sometimes he, he gets put in a bad spot because he comes at number four. And... Uh, the game can be coming really slow, and at a uh, strike rate for him at fifty six point one, he can he uh, he can change the game, and he has done that in many matches in the World Test Championship. Uh, and yeah, yeah. So um, of course, like when you think of like the most important player in India, any India eleven, it's got to be Virat Kohli. Because, um, th- like you said, the man can make or break a game, regardless of he- if he's in form or not. Like you mentioned, he has an average of like 42.4. I believe he has hit uh, 200s in this World Test Championship. Of course, he hasn't hit 100 in a while. Like, uh, I think like two and a half years or so now. Uh, yeah, I believe so. But at the same time, even in the 50s that he's hit, he has made a valuable contribution to the team. And he- even... Even the little bits count because he's also the captain. He needs to lift his team no matter what, whether it be with the bat or with his words when it comes to hyping the team up. So when when you look at the most valuable player in a team, and it's usually the captain, and even more so with Virat Kohli because of how much he means to the team as such. Just a small note on what his contributions can do. In that first test in the Australia tour where people like to remember it for the 36 all out, but... If you look at the first innings of that, which was uh, one of the only two innings Kohli played in that tour, he hit 74, and he came in in a spot of trouble when India were in a slight spot of bother. And he, he took forward a partnership with Rahane, and he scored 74. It looked like he was going to get to 100. Of course, there was the dreaded run out that happened after. But in the end of the day, he looked as in form as ever. And... He just seems to be in a bad patch when it comes to luck or when it comes... Yeah, luck hasn't been on his side, really, if you look at his dismissals in the past year or so. But at least he can take comfort in knowing that it's not his skill that is the, that is fallen or that's the issue here. It's more of a, okay, this is a bad patch, but he, he can get through it. And he has gone through it before. This is nothing like the uh, lows he experienced in 2014, where it was a complete technical flaw that he had. And he's coming back to England where, I mean, the last time when he was in England, he dominated. He had like 600 runs in a test series against England uh, in five games. So, like, I mean, he knows this place like the back of his hand now. So he should be really looking forward to this. And like I said before, if there's any platform where he can strike back and get that 100 again, has to be this one. Yeah, and I mean, people say that he hasn't got 100 in the past two years, which is true. But if you look at his stats, he's got one of the most 50s in international cricket in the past two years, which is all of them have been important for the team. And like you said, uh, he's uh, also the captain. So uh, he's also like like he, he's led India to the final to World Test Championship. He's also done, uh, if you just... Quick, take a quick look at RCB. He's done that well. He's uh, got RCB in winning turns right now. But uh, coming back, uh, you can see that he's been uh, doing really well in Test Championship. And even though he hasn't uh, been scoring hundreds, like the one against Oz, uh, Australia, he would have scored 100. However, even though he got run out by Rahane, if you, if you heard what he said right after that, he he said that, don't worry, uh, keep on going try and uh, try and get more runs you know and i mean that that's where uh, the captaincy uh, comes in of Kohli. he doesn't even though he would be 
um, uh, internally mad that he got out he would be more focused on the team and he knows how to control his anger at times when uh, the team needs it the most and that's what that's what make him makes him a very good and successful captain yeah i mean uh, to, I, I, another thing on Kohli as well when people think of Kohli and aggression they always think of the 2013 or 2014 Kohli when, it, when he was the uh, rowdy youngster who used to go up to people and say Are bench or kya kare, and something like that but I mean language wise he might not have changed that regard but in terms of maturity he has definitely changed and this is what captaincy has brought to him when you lead a team as powerful as India one of the most famous sports teams in the world in, in any sport right now you've got to if if you don't have maturity the maturity will be beaten into you either by your own performance or by the weight of your own leadership and responsibility so that's that's given him some things to think about and so that's led him to mature and control his anger better and it's only resulted in good things for him where he can control his team better he can and motivate his team better players enjoy his leadership more so that's the truth of Cody's leadership like you said he he gives his gives his all to the team and what people fail to realize is that and they may they might take this for granted but Cody has like a 70% win rate as captain which is one of the highest of all time in any in, 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 for any captain it's, i think it, i'm pretty sure it's more than ms tony uh it's it's more than sort of ganguly and it's up there with in the realms of like Steve Waugh and Ricky Ponting. So when you think of those terms of like all-time greatest captains, he's definitely up there. But I guess we seem to take it for granted because we're too used to India winning, I guess. Yeah, I mean, he, yeah, I, I think the only like two, three people that are above him is like Steve Waugh, Ricky Ponting. But I mean, those are all, I mean, those are all legends, of course. And people, yeah, people do take all his granted when it comes to captaincy. So, yeah, and shouldn't be taken for granted. Yeah. Okay, so now looking at Kane Williamson, the other famous side of the story, he has been amazing. That like that, That's all you can say. Hmm. He, he's played only 14 innings, which is eight less than what Kohli has played, yet he still got 817 runs at a strike, uh, at a... Uh, average of 58 almost 60 which is if if you think about test you did not even think about that and uh yeah i mean he's also his higher score he's been getting double hundred centuries it's just like you, you just <laughs> he, he, you just expect a hundred out of him but he, even though he he didn't play the best he could have in uh the first test match against um new uh, england uh he he still, uh, you know, proved himself in New Zealand at home, and he just conquered every yeah. single team that. Yeah, he he's uh, like recently he was uh, uh, the number one ranked Test batsman in the world for a while. Uh, I believe that would change now because of he, he missed he didn't do that well in the first Test against England, and he missed the second Test against England. So. Uh, Ratings predict him to lose about nine points. By the time this podcast is released, you'll probably already know. But uh, he's expected to be usurped by Steve Smith again, who will become number one again, despite not having played for a while. Uh, but yeah, Kane himself, he has had an outstanding couple of years. And at home, he was dominating. I think, if I'm not wrong, he had like a couple of double hundreds as well in, that, uh, in, in the World Test Championship so far. And I guess... There's another thing when you talk about leaders and like cultivating your own team culture. And uh, Kane Williamson's taken after Brendan McCullum's captaincy in the way of uh, you can be aggressive in your captaincy and in the style of play without being aggressive on field itself, without being aggressive in terms of expression of words or emotions or whatever. So it's about channeling that inner uh, determination and emotion into actions uh, and uh, decisions made as a captain, which I think Kane has done uh, perfectly well. And he's cultivated a culture in the team where I guess I guess it's like actions speak louder than words. And where uh, wherever you feel beaten down or back into a corner, there's always some way out of it. And when you look at New Zealand and how they've risen from, they used to be like 
I, I'm pretty sure that at one point, like a few many years ago, uh, not even many years ago, probably like six or seven years ago, they used to be like fifth or sixth in the test rankings. Even as soon as like four years ago, they used to be fifth or sixth in the test rankings. And then the rapid climb up to first right now. And when you think about that, you have to attribute it to Kane uh, mostly, I guess, because he's led as a player, he's led as a captain and like like Coley did with his team from 2014 to now, he cultivated his own team from whenever he started captaincy. So uh, I, he's very similar to Coley in that regard. Uh, when you look at Coley's team, when you look at uh, Williamson's team, you can really see that it is their team. You can you can observe the fact that their culture has, um, I guess, uh, gone on to the rest of the players as well. So. Yeah, you can you can truly say it's Coley's team versus Williamson's team at this point. Yeah, exactly. Both both teams are uh, led by great captains and great players. So, I mean, it's going to be a very fair game. Yeah. Okay. Now, coming to the mo- most important part of this episode, the bowlers. Now, the bowlers of both the teams are deadly, and when I mean deadly, I mean deadly. They both have conquered several areas and they have obliterated teams. They have like literally ripped apart uh, the one of the greatest batsmen in the teams. And we, we just saw that recently uh, that New Zealand just uh, conquered uh, England uh, like yeah day before yesterday. But yeah, so if we see the first uh, uh, bowler, the uh, Trent Bold, he's been amazing. He's just he just came he came back for the second test uh, uh, against England, and he uh, and in the World Test Championship he's played nine matches only, and uh, he's he's got an outstanding uh, thirty four wickets, which is a lot for just playing nine matches. And even his average is a bit high, but uh, I think uh, he's been taking wickets of at the most important times. He's cleaned up matches quickly, and uh, his best figures were like uh, were four. Wick, uh, he's got a lot of four wicket hauls, and uh, yeah, he's been amazing. And if you look at the other side, comparing Bold, there's Jasprit Bumrah. Yeah. Now he's been out. He's he's just been. Like amazing, you know. He he's he's played nine matches as well. He's got exact amount of wickets as well. So I mean, they've literally played the same matches, same. Uh, they've got the same wickets, and it's very fair and even. Yeah, uh, well, Boomer's. I'm sorry. Uh, I was gonna say a bit more about Boomer. Is uh, when you look at Boomer, he only came into the Test circuit in like 2018. So he's pretty new to the Test, uh, like the Test atmosphere, as opposed to Bolt, who is pretty cultivated in that he has like 260 odd test wickets by now so it's pretty he used to test cricket i'd say Bumrah's job he's he's rapidly become the lead strike bowler for india and he's only been here for like 20 odd tests and he's only played nine tests in the world test championship but he's already taken it by the scruff and he is he is he is uh taking to test cricket like a fish to water really it's like he be, it's like he belonged here this whole time. When you think back on his performances in any overseas tour, uh, you think back to West Indies when he went to West Indies and took a hat trick and took uh, like figures of six for twenty seven, and he had another innings in West Indies where he took uh, five for seven. And when you look at those figures, they are just amazing figures. And uh, you think back to other pace bowlers that India have or have had, and none of them have had an as outstanding a uh, debut to, uh, to like 20 matches as Boomer has had. I don't know. I think he's taken like 90 odd wickets in test cricket up to this point. So uh, he's actually relatively experienced. Other people still tend to think, oh, he's a new kid on the block. But he's still, he is still 20 tests in, nearly 100 wickets in. So he is a strike bowler. So it's, uh, it's only fair that he's compared against Bolt, who is New Zealand strike bowler, I would say. Both have a similar job in the sense of with the new ball, take wickets with the swing and seam. And with the old ball, both of them can come back with some reverse swing as well, can f- throw in the bouncers because they they both have a sharp bouncer. Uh, both have whippy actions, which result in them being able to fluctuate between the short ball to the length ball to the Yorker very, very well. So... 
like you said, it's it's perfectly fair to compare two two of the, the two strike bowlers and two of the best bowlers in the world right now against each other. Yeah, and I mean, if you see like uh, Boomerang, like you said, Boomerang is new uh, to the Test atmosphere, while Bolt has been playing a while. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, Boomerang has done a fantastic start to his career. Like he mm-hmm. he's dominated. The, like like you said, he got like five for seven against West Indies, and he. Uh, he's got many other five wicket hauls. His best uh, figures was six for twenty-seven, and uh, yeah, he he he's a wicket taker, and uh, I I say he would do no less against New Zealand. Yeah, uh, I guess the only thing where uh, Boomerang uh, where Boomerang found some a uh, bit of a chink in his own armor again happened to be in New Zealand, where he didn't have a great run of form across formats. Really, I don't think he took a. I think he took like only two wickets across both the tests and ODIs in that series. To be fair, once Boomerang has come back from his injury uh, a little uh, like last year, uh, he hasn't been the same really. He's still been a really good bowler. His economy has been great. He keeps the runs like down in terms of limited overs cricket. And in test cricket, he can still swing the ball well. But he just, like Kohli can't seem to get hundreds. Boomra can't seem to get those four wickets or five wicket hauls, but he can pick up a couple of wickets here and there, even when he's not in the best of form coming back from injury. So when you think of that and you think how long he's had to rest and he played the IPLs to show that, hey, I can still bowl, I'm in form with the ball. Think of the rest he's had since then. He'll be ready and up for firing right now. So you can only imagine the damage he could do. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I mean, you would expect that from any person that's gone f- through a long injury and uh, like a phase that uh, that would change. But yeah, he will come back strong and he, he, he is going to. So coming to the next one, Sham- uh, Mohammed Shami versus Neil Wagner. Now, both of them are again uh, very uh, dominant and they also take a lot of wickets. Shami has uh, played 10 matches and has got 36 w- wickets. That, that, that's uh, very good, especially considering that uh, he hasn't played every single match uh, against all the teams that, he ha- uh, that India has played in the World Test Championship. And al- also, uh, his uh, what best figures were five wicket hauls. He al- I think he also got like two, three, four wicket hauls. And... He's also got wickets uh, for India when they're most needed, or he's also got uh, like wickets at the end. Uh, and his average is an outsta- outstanding 19.7, which is amazing for a test bowler. He's also played tons of, uh, I mean, uh, test matches. He has experience. Yeah, uh, Shami with the ball, he's been, he's been like the perfect, First change bowler. So when you think of India's bowling attack, you usually think Ishan Sharma and Bumra with oh, will open with the new ball. And then when you come to Mohammed Shami, Mohammed Shami has the ex, like expert skill set. He can swing the ball with the new ball. So you can call him up for there if you need to. He's an expert seam bowler. He's probably the best seam bowler in the Indian attack. So you can call him back at any point of time. And in especially in England as well, where you can get seam movement or movement out the seam. Uh, almost whenever you'd like perfect chance for Shami as well and then he can throw in the bouncers because he's really good with the short ball as well so when you think of Shami you think of a guy who can bowl at any point in the innings or any point with the in the game new ball old ball against a top order middle order lower order whatever it may be you can call upon Shami anytime yeah and yeah and now if you look at Neil Wagner he's also been amazing even though he's played only seven matches he's got 32 wickets so if he did play 14 innings, he got 30. That's more than two wickets of, like per innings, which is uh, for a bowler that's uh, like he, I don't think he opens the bowling and uh, he's, he's just very fierce. His bouncers are just ridiculous. And uh, yeah, his, his uh, average is 22.5, which is also really good. And he's, he's helped New Zealand to get, uh, quick wickets and when it, like as soon as he's come in uh he's also been very economical yeah yeah uh, about neil wagner i'm i'm a big fan of neil wagner personally and i've always found him intriguing in the way that i think he's the most unique fast bowler that i've seen in 
in probably since I started watching cricket, so I guess the last 10 years or so. And when you think of his own skill set and how he takes wickets, that becomes even more apparent. I've watched the video uh, by uh, Jared Kimber, uh, who is an analyst, about uh, how how Neil Wagner takes his wickets and how he compared against every other pace bowl in the world. He doesn't have the pace of, say, a Jasprit Bumrah or a Mitchell Stark. He bowls at around uh, 130s, mid-130s or so. But then you look at his bouncers and you see batsmen ducking and, and getting out to his bouncers and you wonder, hey, what's all this about? But then you look at the style of wh- how he bowls and where he bowls. He bowls, he can f- uh, fluctuate his length just so slightly to make a possibly uh, chest-high ball into a shoulder-height ball without the batsman even realizing it. And then when you look at when he bowls as well, they, uh, New Zealand uh, take him as a first-change bowler. So in that way, he's similar to Shami in the sense after the new ball is completely taken by uh, Bolt and Southie in this case, he comes in with uh, bouncers and he can also swing the ball as well. So like Shami, you can call him on at any time. The thing about Wagner, though, is he bowls long spells. Throughout the World Test Championship, you would have seen him bowl up to like 15 over spells continuously knocking over by over and you you have to admire the man's stamina because he comes charging at you same pace same deadly accuracy again probably one of the most accurate fast bowlers in the world right now and he comes at you with that accuracy and keeps bowling it at your body if you even if you're going to leave it over and over you're not going to get runs you're not going to rotate strike there's going to be some frustration from one end so one of you is going to have to take action by either like going for a shot or trying something different, which leads to wickets. So you can almost see why he's got 32 wickets in seven games, as you said, because number one, he bowls very long spells and he has deadly accuracy. So there's not many people um, in the pl- on the planet who have that accuracy and even with low pace and that much stamina, they can take wickets at any point in the game. So he's, he is one of the best in the world right now and for the last like 20 years in my opinion yeah and uh moving on now uh now now things get interesting here because uh these bowlers have been around for a very long time and they've played very well and uh they've uh, uh proved themselves almost uh at home outside home and these players are like ishan sharma and tim saudi see Ishan Sharma, he has he's played eleven matches and thirty six wickets. His he has got many five wicket hauls and his average is seventeen point three six. Like that's insane. Like yeah, that's insane. And uh, he's uh, he's been amazing. He, uh, like to open the ball for India, he's got quick wickets in the England series. He he got uh, burns out uh, like in the like first uh, two three overs. Uh, he, he uh, and even in the uh, all series, he uh, he got a lot of wickets, and he also I um. Played, I don't think he played the Australian series. I I think uh, I'm pretty sure that it was only. Oh wait, oh yeah, he didn't. Yeah, uh, he didn't. Well, he's still been outstanding, okay, guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no problem. Uh, and I mean, like, average of seventeen is no joke. So that is true. Uh, yeah. yeah. More on Nishant as well. When you look at Ishan Sharma, you if you like rewind back to like six years ago, what were you when you've asked the Ishan Sharma? He, they were probably say overrated, just a workhorse. He can bowl the short ball now and then, but he just he's just there for Dhoni to use to bowl long spells while the spinners take some rests. He had to be fair to them, they might have had a point as well because he might have had like hundred and fifty odd wickets at that point of time. But he was averaging somewhere between like 36 and 37 with the ball, which is not what you want your pace bowlers to average. Usually you want them to average sub 30 or there, there or thereabouts. But then when you uh, look at Ishan's transformation, which has been insane, since 2018, he has averaged sub 20 with the ball, taking 70 odd wickets. I think it's, I'm pretty sure it's 77 wickets in 22 games since 2018 at an average of sub 20. And then you look at that and he's right up there with the Jimmy Andersons or Stuart Broads and in terms of accuracy and his role to the team, which is a swing bowler. who He, he basically pitches it up, uh, swings it away from left-handers as well, uh, can throw in the short ball here and there. Classic opening test match bowler. And we've needed one of those for years now to partner 
our bowlers who are more um, more better, I guess, in the fields of uh, short ball bowling or seam or pace. But now you have an accurate bowler who can bowl swing in the first few overs and can, you know, he's skilled with reverse swing, skilled with the short ball, skilled with seam movement, expert against left-handers. So you look at his transformation from what he was, which was just a workhorse for short, short ball bowling, to now where he's India's premier bowler in the test match format. It's admirable, and that's why he, that's what makes him uh, like one of the best like underdog stories or success stories of this World Test Championship. Yeah, I mean, he there was a post recently on Instagram that I saw. He, he, uh, the period of well, since he debuted till like 2018. He, he averaged like 35 plus and then uh and like like you said he he then like picked it up his average went down to almost 20 uh and yeah he just that tran- like the transformation and that that phase just changed him yeah now moving on now here's where things are like insane tim saudi 10 matches 51 wickets. Yes, you heard me right. 51 wickets. He's he he's got wickets. I think every single match that he's played. Like I don't think he's ever gone wicketless. <laughs> like he uh he he's been outstanding for the team. He like even in the England series recently, he he got uh, wick, uh many wickets in the first match uh where uh even where England I mean New Zealand were struggling to get wickets on England. Uh he's he's got breakthroughs. Uh, again, to the best bowler uh, batsman uh, of all time, and he has averaged also like twenty point six six, and uh, he he's got five firsts, four firsts, everything. Yeah, when you look at Tim Saudi again, a uh, very experienced bowler, he's been with New Zealand for ages. This is like <laughs> this is a perfect uh, like comparison to Ishan Sharma because they're both very experienced, been with their teams for a long time, and their roles have. Uh, in some way changed. Saudi, of course, has always been your premier swing bowler for New Zealand, one of the best swing bowlers in the world for ages now. He's sort of fallen off in like the limited overs format, specifically like the ODI format or the T20 format. But in Test, he's remained one of the premier bowlers in the world. Uh, like like Yashan Sharma, he is their best bowler with the new ball, uh, swinging it uh, and against right-handers, left-handers. Wherever that may be, uh, New Zealand or England or Australia, he's effective. He, he does like like Wagner as well. He doesn't bowl at a high pace. You don't see him bowling at like high one forties or even one forties at all. The bowl mid one thirties, but the swing is what gets you. And where those fifty one wickets have come from is a lot of them have come from the swing or seam movement, which he's an expert of. Uh, again, like Yashan Sharma, he has almost like I think like two fifty to three hundred wickets in the Test match format. So. He, uh, he brings that experience to the New Zealand attack, which has a lot of new faces now as well. So that's always valuable, especially when you have your senior bowler to lead you. Yeah, I mean, he, the, the both, they both almost contribute like kind of the same uh, role in the team right now. And they've both, like, you know, they've played with the team a long time. So both experienced. Yeah. So next is the last pair of the... Uh, uh, pace attack for India in New Zealand, which is Siraj and Jameson. Now, Siraj, he has he debuted against Australia, and he did. I mean, he he did pretty well. Uh, he got his first wicket of P- uh, Pavoski, uh, and uh, that I, I that was a really special moment for him. His his father had passed away like uh, a few um, what days ago. I mean, not days, but uh, a few that. a few yeah before that. And um, uh, he also uh, he dedicated that to him because I, he wanted his father to see that he de- uh, made India team. Uh, so it's been an emotional journey for him, even uh, against England. I think uh, in the national anthem he started crying. Uh, because uh, he was remembering his dad so uh yeah and he's also he got a five wicket haul against australia which was one of the best performances uh that was the gaba match mm-hmm. and um Very i think uh 
Yeah, exactly. He he played the the uh, innings that he needed to for India, and he just started getting the wickets. And I I I, I saw that uh, Australia were nine down. Siraj had four wickets. I was like, please come on, get the last wicket. Yeah, yeah. And he did. So yeah, yeah. he deserved it. The man has, like you said, it's been an emotional journey for him. He's worked really really hard to get to this point. I've always been an advocate of Mohammad Siraj in the Test match format or first class format. Even when he was getting like bullied by Andre Russell in the IPL, and when he used to go for like at an economy of eleven, and sometimes, admittedly, he would lose matches for RCB. But T Twenty has never been his special or format as such. In the Ranji Trophy, for example, he's averaged around twenty to twenty one in the Ranji Trophy across like three or four seasons. It was obvious what his format was, and even though he has improved drastically in the T Twenty format as well, his main format is still with the red ball or with the pink ball and that that's where he's come that's where he's come from and it's a good thing that they've real they, they realized that finally and put him in the test squad because like i said thoroughly deserved it and backed it up with performances as well with like you said 16 wickets uh five games uh we've got a fifer in australia which is a, a, a good feat to do as well i guess especially against a full strength australian batting lineup uh so even though he is relatively inexperienced he's come in into the possibly the most toughest situation that you can come in as a debut bowler uh, emotionally and in terms of match and tactics and he he excelled he excelled expectations and that's what makes him a part of the indian lineup and a, a part of the indian attack now even if he's a backup yeah so i mean if you see now jameson now he he's uh he he also debuted recently. I, I I don't know against who. I think what Australia maybe. He or, debuted in uh, the well. I'm I'm not sure who. No, he was supposed to debut against Australia, but he debuted in the next series, which I think was the West Indies, if I'm not wrong. I'm um, I'm just rattling that off the top of my head. But what I do remember is he did insanely well in across his debut series, and he debuted at the beginning of the home season of New Zealand. So there were like a couple series that he played. I think three series he played. Well, oh, did he debut against India? Uh yeah, I I I think he played against India. He he debuted against India, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because yeah, I remember he got insane figures against India. He literally ripped her bowling apart. Uh yeah. I mean batting apart. So uh yeah, he's been outstanding. He's played six matches and only got thirty six wickets, which is amazing for especially a new bowler. Uh, just like Siraj, as uh, except he is, uh, he has done better, at, at also an average of thirteen point two seven. Yeah, which I, I mean, it's just getting it's just getting lower and lower. <laughs> uh, yeah, he's been outstanding, and I, there's no doubt he's gonna change. But he also got wickets in uh, um, uh, England, so yeah, yeah. He's, he's. Well, I guess that leads well. to that gets. I guess that leads to like a problem of plenty more so for New Zealand than India because when you look at India, their backup of Siraj, who of course is a worthy backup to any of the three uh, first choice bowlers, which is Boomer, uh, Shami, and Ishan. But when you look at Siraj himself, you wouldn't slot him in as a first choice above any of those three. But then when you look at New Zealand side, when you look at Jameson, who where do you fit him in? Because he is an integral part of that lineup as well. He brings that side of short bowling where he's a really, really tall bowler. So he's like a perfect support for Neil Wagner because even though Wagner does bowl long spells, you need someone on the other end to hold up the runs and hold up the attack. And with Jameson, who can swing the ball with the new ball, again, proper seam movement he gets as well. Uh, very ex- uh, like high expertise at seam movement. And then his main weapon, which is the short ball. You look at that, and then you think, okay, he needs to be in that lineup somehow. You've got to fit him in. We'll discuss that later, but I guess that's a problem of plenty that New Zealand have right now. Yeah. No, yeah. So next, I mean, we move on. That that that's basically the pace attack. So I mean, I know this can be controversial, but I th- I think uh, Ishan Sharma, uh, Shami Pumra, and Siraj will be the four playing against New Zealand in the World Test Championship. Final. Are you saying there'll be some four, people... uh, four pacers against in in the final? Yeah. Well, the thing the thing is <laughs> and... with, with the four pacers thing is 
Uh, I can see that happening probably in New Zealand where you won't have any help for spinners, but in England you do have, you just still have some help for spinners. And even if you, if you play four pacers, who's going to bat at number eight? Your tail is going to be like the longest ever. You're going to have Ishan Sharma batting six down and <laughs> you, the moment you're like, because we've seen India and England before, if you're like 150 for six, you're not going to get much support from the rest of the players. You're going to be like... Yeah, exactly. You get all up for 160. Out. Yeah. So yeah. I guess that that is the main issue why people don't play four frontline pace bowlers in a single game. But I can see where you're coming from with that, though. Yeah. I mean, I've also... Uh, I mean, New Zealand, uh, I, I think, like, confirmed playing four pacers. Uh, but talking about India, I, my friend also told me that... Um, uh, that, you know, Thakur would be a better choice than Siraj because Thakur is also a batting choice. He he did, he got a debut 50. And um, I think he also, he can swing the ball as well as, uh, you know, contain wickets and keep good economy. So That's true. But when you look but, at, when you look at Thakur as a bowler, you wouldn't really slot him above anyone else in that Indian lineup. Admittedly, he did decently in Australia, especially as given that he was called on short notice and was a backup, like a backup of a backup of a backup bowler. Uh, but even then, you probably still wouldn't slot him above, say, a Siraj, even for his batting. Because um, in my opinion, you shouldn't get a fast bowler who's not as skilled as another fast bowler just because he provides uh, a little bit of batting ability. So, especially when you have other players of other aspects who do provide batting ability. You have three of the best players. Yeah, I mean, anyway. uh, yeah, exactly. I, I agree with that. Um, also, look, I mean, looking at uh, India's, uh, what is it, number eight position, there's a few people that can play there. So, there's Ashwin, uh, who's a spinner. There's um, Thakur, <laughs> and there's Siraj. Those are the main three that are probably going to get controversed about. And well, uh, I mean, there's also... You... Oh, sorry. Well, I was going to say, when you look at it from like a basic point of view, when you look at the number eights there, you think Ashwin, he's played a number eight before. Batting ability has hit hundreds before. Recently hit 100 against England. Uh, in form with the bat, in form with the ball. Needs to be in the team anyway. So might as well put him at number eight. Then you look at the other side, which is uh, Thakur, who is... Even though he hit that one important 50 in Australia, uh, probably still wouldn't slot him above the rest of the people in that pecking order. I mean, look at Siraj, he's not even a number 8. Realistically, he's a number 11. So you wouldn't really put him anywhere near that number 8 spot, in my opinion. So when you I mean, look at I'm, I'm like just that, saying that because, I mean, the rest of the last three, the, the bowlers are already selected, the three of them. So I'm just saying number 8 because, I mean, yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, Siraj won't bat number eight. Ishant will bat before him, and probably even uh, Xiaomi or something. But, None of them. Uh, are, yeah. In the end, they like what we've what people have said about India is Ishant, Xiaomi, and uh, Bumrah. Those are three number elevens. You uh, like they're experts with the ball. But they're not so much with the bat. So realistically, you're talking. Hey, about hey, Ishan. hey! Boomer got a fifty. Okay. Boomer did. Boomer <laughs> did get a fifty in a practice match. Ishan's got a fifty as well in a test against uh, West Indies. But uh, apart from that, for the most part, they are I mean, yeah. almost walking wickets. Realistically, so when you're when you have India at one fifty for seven, you're gonna be one fifty five all out if they keep strike. And we yeah, I mean that's tail end before. definition of tail end. So. Yeah, that's not their job either. Really, so you you, you can't you, blame them. You can't really fault them for it. So that's why you need someone at number eight who can bat at least and support them. Which is what yeah, there have been rumors them. saying that there have been rumors saying that uh, Jadeja might not play because they might play uh, four Pacers and uh, Ashwin. Which well, I I, which I mean won't. the thing is I wouldn't I wouldn't agree with that so much because like again. This isn't uh, an England pitch like Lords, uh, where India played uh, in England at Lords in like I think 2018, where it was just a green top, and then you had Pacers bowl that ripped them apart for like hundred all out in 20 overs. But then the uh, this pitch is set to be more dry, really. It's 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 of course will be green on your first day, but there it's set to be conducive for spinners and. There's also going to be rain on some of the days there. We'll get to the weather a bit a bit later, but in the end, it is more. It is. It will be slightly conducive for spin on the later days as well, which is why even and given Jadeja's batting ability, we'll get to him himself a bit later as well. But 
But given Jadeja's batting ability, I'd say it's perfectly fine to slot him and Ashwin into the team with three paces, and you've got a whole rounded, well-rounded attack. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of options India has, so it'll be interesting to see what they finally do come for. And another thing is, everyone's going to come with their full energy. Uh, the whole team's going to come with their full force because it's, it's a one-off test, so... Uh, they don't have to worry about, uh, I think you've mentioned this, they don't have to, like, uh, against Australia, they don't have to worry about having backups in case people get injured. And, I mean, even if people get injured, we have plenty of backups for almost every single position. So I don't think there's really a big worry for that. Right. Now, moving on to the spin. Uh, Ashwin and Santner. Now, Ashwin has played a huge role for India in this World Test Championship. And... He has proved himself a lot, and he, he like and stats show it. So he's played thirteen matches and got sixty seven wickets. Like most I India. mean, yeah, most for India, and he's been amazing. He, he's he's almost got uh what is it? He uh he's in top five for bowling rankings, I think, for a uh, test. No, he's, and yeah. he's, uh, he's number two, I believe. In fact, he's right after. Yeah, I mean, the first spinner. That's amazing. Like, uh. Yeah, his his best figures are like seven is a seven wicket haul. Uh, he's had plenty of five wicket hauls. Like his five five wicket haul is like nothing for him now. Yeah, uh, he bowls many overs. There, but, and, yeah, yeah, and I mean, like you just said, he bowls so many overs, yet he still averages twenty point eight. Yeah, like uh, he he's a very economical bowler. He gets wickets. Like he has a he has some people that he can always get out, like uh, Ben Stokes. Uh, he can always somehow uh, left handers when you look him. at when you look at Ashwin against left handers. Fun fact: Ashwin is the bowler to have taken the wickets of the most left handers in the world. So when you he's oh. taken, I think like around two hundred wickets of his are of left handers. There's been no one who's taken more wickets than that of left handers. So when you look at him against left handers, it's a pretty one sided battle usually. Yeah, uh, he's been amazing. Uh, he he's he's. He's also proved himself in batting recently in, uh, at a home series against England. He hit 100 at uh, at his home stadium, which meant uh, like a lot to him. And he was happy because he didn't know the next time he was going to play a test match over there. He might not even play another test match there. And uh, I, I guess it was probably the best thing that could have happened. He got like seven, eight wickets and a, a century in that match. So, um, yeah. And he he's been overall he's going to be a big part of the uh um uh what World Test Championship final he's he's going to do well most likely yeah well another thing about Ashwin is when you look at the evolution of Ashwin as a spin bowler like he was number one for a while in twenty sixteen seventeen when India were playing their home se- home se- home they had their home season and every time India have their home season you see Ashwin and Jadeja rise up the bowling rankings as usual because it's their it's basically their fortress you're going to get wickets there uh, if you're a spinner but then when you look at the evolution of ashwin especially as such overseas he completely changed his approach to how he bowls overseas he started to adapt to changes in surfaces perfect example of this is when he went to australia he got steve smith out uh, like three times uh, in the first like two games for like zero one and zero so when you look at that you think oh he's uh, he's evolved and but how has he done it? So when you look at how he's bowled in Australia, he took up more of the overspin that Nathan Lyon does. So Ashwin's very used to the side spin that you get on Indian surfaces. So the reason you need side spin on Indian surfaces is it doesn't rely more on bounce. So it relies more on just sharp turn and grip onto the surface. So side spin is better for that. But when you look at Australia where bounce matters, so for example, when you're Nathan Lyon, how does he get most wickets? You'll, he'll be bowling and it'll spin into the right-hander, take the glove, pop straight to short leg. Why? Because of the bounce that get, that traps him on the glove instead of the bat. So that overspin is what Ashwin learned and adapted to and used that in Australia and got many wickets. I think he got like 15 wickets in Australia, which is the most for any off-spinner that's gone there uh, for a while. Uh, and he only played like three games, I, I believe. He didn't play the last one because he got injured. But the point is, he has adapted and he has learned that, okay, you need to have a different style of bowling in overseas conditions. And that's what sets him apart from the rest of the spin bowlers in the world. And 
I, that's why I think that he'll take the challenge of bowling on an in, in an English pitch, like to the best of his ability, and he'll do well at Wales. Yeah, and uh, he's also uh, like uh, he, he's a dependable bowler. You know, you can you can trust him to do whatever uh, you do. What you want him to do, if you want him to, and he's bowled plenty of overs. I think he's bowled one of the most overs probably in World Test Championship. He he can. He and he's also fit at at his age. I don't know what he is, but he, I, I think he's thirty five plus. Thirty four, I believe. Yeah. Oh yeah, but and uh, I think he he's still fit and he's also doing uh like really well. He's able to bowl like fifty overs consistently, and yeah, he he just yeah he's just been really good for India. Yeah, well, obviously, when you look at one of the the best spin bowler in the world. You gotta say it's Ravi Ashwin, especially now that he's uh, conquered the Australian challenge. You've got to say that. Oh, I'm gonna give it to him. Four hundred plus wickets in only seventy games. That's like more. That's like nearly six wickets a game for seventy games straight. That's in the realms of like Murali or Shane Warne or something like that. So you've yeah. gotta give him props. Him best spin bowler in the current era, in my opinion. Which is also why I think it's unfair to compare him with Mitchell Sandner, who we'll get to <laughs> next. Uh, Mitchell Sandner, as the stats say, uh, four wickets, four matches, three wickets, average of uh, 126, Bradman style. But uh, I guess the point is, when you look at Sandner, uh, you don't see him as a wicket-taking role. When it comes to New Zealand, when, you, when you're when you a spin bowler in New Zealand, it's more like a spinner's graveyard because that's why New Zealand usually play like four pacers. They only play the spinner if there's a my new chance that on day five you're going to get some turn but that's why they play Sandner. Sandner has played roles with the bat on a number of occasions he uh this was uh this is not so much the world test championship but uh, against england in a test before the world test championship he hit a hundred to save uh, new zealand from like 200 for six and along with bj watling took him to like uh 600 plus so uh, he plays roles with the bat and shepherding the lower order as a spinner usually does in a team. So he has his role there, but in terms of wicket taking, you don't really see him taking wickets. So I'd be surprised, to be fair, if they even played him in the in the uh, test against India. But they, if if they do, it might be because they expect a little bit of turn in days four and five. Yeah, I mean. I mean, look, I'm looking at his overall test stats. And, I mean, it's not that great either. You can't compare, compare him to Ashwin, who's played plenty of games. He's, his experience is, like, next level. And uh, he and I think Sandler is also a person who can uh, who doesn't have to be in the starting 11 for New Zealand, considering they already have four OP uh, bowlers already, like, just waiting to pounce on their lineup. Uh, I think they have that one slot uh, at number seven. Well, number seven would be Watling, to be fair, or or it'll be one of the all rounders, which would be Colin De Grand. Yeah, exactly. Or, so yeah, Daryl Mitchell. Both are seam bowling all rounders again. So if they play them, they'll have five pacers essentially. So if there's anywhere Sander can slot, it would be in that number seven position. But I I don't really see him going in there because uh, then again, unless they see a use for a spinner at all. I mean, yeah, I, I don't think he would be picked because I don't. I mean, he hasn't done that well. Even though he's only given, been given four matches, uh, he hasn't. Uh, he's got only three wickets, uh, which is, uh, I mean, for a guy who hasn't, uh, who hasn't been picked and just uh, gets called up for games here and there, I guess that's uh, just average. So. Um, yeah, I, 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 I don't think he will play, but the only chance he will play is if New Zealand wants some spin. So. Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, to be fair, could possibly solve the number seven spot. Usually, uh, when you have a spin bowling all-rounder, he's there because you want to shepherd the lower order a bit as well. But I'm pretty sure the lower order of Saudi and uh, Jameson, both they can bat really, really well. Bolt can stand on his own two feet perfectly fine and bat. And Wagner against England, we saw him hit a few shots here and there as well. All of them can pretty much stand on their own two feet when it comes to batting, so I think they don't need to worry about even batting Saudi at number 8 itself. So, uh, <laughs> again, they would only need Sandner if they absolutely did, and if not, 
then they could turn to their other spinner, uh, which is uh, Ajaz Patel. So when you look at Ajaz Patel, um, I, uh, he, de- he debuted against uh, Pakistan in the UAE in like 2018, played an em- enormous role to, for them to win that series. He took a fifer in the last game where New Zealand had their backs against the wall, basically, uh, to secure them their first win a series win against Pakistan and in the UAE in like 60 odd years. So when you look at uh, the feats that he has achieved in the short career that he's had, that one is probably the main deal which has allowed him to be in the team continuously. He played the last test, I believe, in against England. Um, I'm not sure he did uh, too well. I'm not sure. I don't know the exact stats off the top of my head, to be honest. But... Uh, but I mean, the, you have the stats in front of you, right? Oh uh, yeah, I mean, uh, he he's played what three matches? He's got nine wickets. I mean, he he has done better than uh, Santner in the World Test Championship, but uh, he, uh, I guess Santner just more experience as a player overall. I think he can uh, I don't know, adjust and uh, uh, you know, do better, but. Uh, I'll just tell again. He he has got uh, he has played better in the World Test Championship. So one of them might get picked. One of the, both of them might not even get picked for the yeah. uh, starting level. So, but when you uh, look at like when you compare, if like if New Zealand had to pick a spinner, the only reason they would pick Santner is because he can bat. But to be fair, if you want to pick the better spinner, you would pick a Jasper Taylor. And even if if they really really wanted a spinner and you want uh, three pacers. Uh, and the pace bowling all rounder such as the Grand Home or Mitchell, you can have that lineup still be there with Ajaz, but Ajaz can't bat as well as Sandner can, but he can still be a, a valuable number 10 or a number 11 who can hold on. So you can still uh, put him in there without ruining the balance of the team too much. You'll just be omitting a pacer, which I'm not sure New Zealand would like to do anyway. So, like you said, neither may be picked. They pick four pacers. And no spinner for the first test against England, and they did perfectly well. So I'm pretty sure that was to test out the uh, waters of can we play our full strength attack? They didn't even play their full strength attack, mind you. Bolt wasn't there for that first game. So again, look at the depth of their pace bowling attack. They have stocks of bowlers waiting. So I'm pretty sure they'll be perfectly fine with four pacers. And if they even if you need spin, call on Kane Williamson. He can throw a couple. Yeah, games. exactly. He can he can pull a few overs. I mean, he's not even that bad. He can get wickets. Uh, yeah. I mean, looking at uh, New Zealand, they, I mean, to a, to a certain extent, they kind of experiment with this a series, you know? They didn't play a spinner in the first game. I mean, I wouldn't say, yeah, that's why I said to a certain extent, because, I mean, they still did want to win the series. They did. And, uh, yeah, to a certain extent, I think that um, uh, New Zealand, uh, experimented with um england because they could have uh, you know tried different variations they didn't play a spinner in the first test match and uh i mean that's why i said to a certain extent because uh I, they still wanted the series win which they did get so yeah i think they they finally got out maybe they figured out that they don't need a spinner to win the match uh, which uh did uh evidently show in the first test series uh, match so yeah yeah well i mean when new zealand uh don't maybe they don't need to pick a spinner india has the possibility of picking too because they have one of the best all-rounder in the world right now ravi jadeja so when you look at jadeja's stats as well uh look we'll first focus on him with the ball so uh 10 matches 28 wickets that's pretty decent for an all-rounder especially since he didn't bowl that much overseas Got a four, couple four firsts here and there. Average, bit, uh, pretty like decent for a spinner with, of uh, 28. So that's respectable. Uh, but surprisingly enough, his main role has been with the bat. He averages 50 plus with the bat in this World Test Championship. He's hit uh, 50s. He, he hit, uh, did he hit 100? I'm not sure if he hit 100. Uh, in the World Test Championship? Did he hit one against South um, Africa? Back yeah, in I, I don't know. I don't know. But he, he's hit... Okay, we'll cut that bit out. But he, he has hit like a bunch of 50s and he's been really, really important for India in, in shepherding the lower order, adding some quick runs in the back end with Rishabh Pant 
And uh, so when you look at him, even you would take him even as a batsman at this moment because even in the warm up. So India had a intra squad warm up uh, recently, just to, uh, you know, warm up their players before the final. And he had a 50 in that uh, warm up. So he's still red hot with the bat. Uh, he batted well for CSK in the IPL. He is showing the selectors, hey, look, you can select me as a batsman if you want to. After all, he has three triple centuries in domestic, uh, in like the Ranji Trophy. So he's an able batsman. And the fact that he's also one of the best spin bowlers in the world seems like just an add-on at this point. So for me, he would definitely slot in at a number seven spot in Team for sure. Yeah, I mean, like, we all know that he's good at batting and fielding, but when it comes, I mean, batting and bowling, but when it comes to fielding, he's that he's also another different beast over there. Yeah, I mean, he, he, he yeah, and he's also, uh, I mean, almost every match he's got to run out in IPL. He, he decided to, you know, have a fun day with RCB, get some few run outs, yeah. wickets, get some runs. I mean, yeah, he's an overall great fielder. So uh, he's a very great choice for India because he's a dependable bowler. He can he can he get wickets. Um, he can yeah, and uh, with his bowling, he can also uh, he can vary a lot. He can well, one ball will be short and spins a lot. One ball will pitch right next to the batsman's foot and won't turn. Yeah, the so, batsmen aren't uh, able to often catch Jadeja's changes in pace and changes in length, and those are what do, do, like do you in. So as a left-arm spinner, you have the slider, which is the most common weapon. So like the ball will look like it's going to spin, but it will go straight on, and he's very good at disguising it because he can disguise it with changes in like flight, length, and pace. So uh, that's what makes him one of the most skilled bowlers in the world as well. So, but then that's been recently overshadowed by his batting, which has been outstanding as well. So, and like you said, India's best fielder easily. So, basically the truest all-rounder in the sense of the word. So, I mean, for me, uh, if, he's, if he's perfectly fit and perfectly raring to go with both bat and ball, I don't see why he wouldn't be picked at least as a number seven. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, I mean... Yeah, that's about it for the bowling, for the uh, compar- comparison for the India and New Zealand bowling. See, as, as you can see, there's a lot of good bowlers for both teams. It's going to be a very interesting face off. Uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's going to be amazing. Yeah, well, uh, they are also they're, they're playing at uh, Southampton. Uh, so it's, it was supposed to be Lords, and uh, when you look at Lords, you expect like, oh, green top or something like that. But then it moved to Southampton. So if we look at Southampton uh, for, uh, you know, where this is going to be held, so what are the conditions like? What are you going to expect, right? So if you look at the average first inning score in Southampton overall, uh, you, you're talking 337. So in England, uh, that fits well because it's a respectable first innings total. When you bat first in England, you generally want 350-odd. And that's perfectly well if you get through the first two sessions where the ball's swinging and moving you're pretty much set for 350. And if you get like 400, 450, you're, you've almost won the game from there because uh, it's, it's difficult for opponents to come back from that. That's evident by the average second inning score in Southampton, which is 280. So if you get like a 400, that secures you a 100 run lead. You've pretty much won the game from there. Uh, in, if you look at uh, the average scores in 2020 in England's home season in Southampton, uh, it's pretty much almost the same. Average first inning score, 341. Average second inning score, 234. So yet again, second inning seems a lot, lot harder to face uh, than the first inning. So if you win the toss, pretty much no-brainer anyway when it comes to England or almost almost anywhere in the world right now, bat first. And that's what the two yeah. teams will be aiming to do because the like, like almost everywhere else in the world, fourth and fifth days, usually the hardest to bat. Uh, especially given the spinners and the spinners of India, especially when it comes to that. So for me, whoever bats first will win the game unless there's a drastic collapse of some sort. I mean, uh, yeah, the toss does uh, affect the game, but I mean, it, 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 overall, it again, like collapses, everything is part of the game. So I mean, anything could happen. So yeah, I mean, it's going to be interesting. Now, if we see the spin and the pace in Southampton, so here we're looking at 
uh, how the pace has uh, how the pace and spin has fared in this uh, stadium. There's been twenty innings, uh, and uh, there's been hundred and twenty wickets. See, you can already tell by that most of the wickets are uh, from seamers, which uh, does kind of tell you that uh, it makes sense why New Zealand won't want a spinner <laughs> and will uh, preferably have four good uh, pacers. So, um, and for spin, overall, uh, there's 18 innings and almost like around 40 wickets, which is decent for uh, a pitch so it, it does tell you it can turn a little and spinners can get maybe a few wickets so yeah yeah from a historical southampton point of view you're looking at days three four and five where spinners can come into effect especially if it's a spinner like ashwin or jadeja where they get to the ball to talk and to spin off the surface uh it's usually more difficult to extract spin in countries like south africa england new zealand and australia but uh, in England, Southampton is one of the more spin-friendly surfaces in England, if you had to compare it a lot. So, to be fair, maybe it's good to pick one spinner, but in New Zealand's case, hey, if you have four of the best cases in the world, I don't see why you'd worry about picking a spinner too much. Even if it yeah. could add a little bit, uh, I'm pretty sure the extra pacer could add a lot more. And given the fact that they can all bat pretty much well, and, or at least decently, uh, there's no reason for them not to. So they don't have the problem that India have, where if they pick four pacers, you have four number 11s. Uh, so, and, but then India, on the flip side, you pick the two spinners, Jadeja and Ashwin. You get two great batsmen. You get two of the best spinners and the best fielder, all packaged like uh, into two people. So it's also a very tempting choice to, for them to pick two spinners as opposed to New Zealand, who might pick no spinners. So that's a that's an interesting duality in terms of that. Yeah. I Personally, I think that India will play only one spinner. So I think uh, I Ashwin wouldn't will be left. They, I, maybe they... I, no, well, from in my point of view, if they had to pick a spinner, Ashwin is the better spinner. You would only pick Jadeja because he's like way beyond in terms of batting ability. But uh, even if you pick Jadeja as a spinner... Uh, you would have to. You wouldn't. You still wouldn't have four pace bowlers. At least I wouldn't expect India to pick four pace bowlers. They've already seen what's happened. They've already done it before. They've uh, picked four pace bowlers. I think twice in the last uh, f- uh, four or five years, and both times it's resulted in collapses of the lower order where they've lost the last four wickets for like ten or twelve runs. And so it's evident that you don't have many paces in India that can bat well. You could pick, a, say, a Shardur Thakur or something, but he doesn't offer as much with the ball as, say, an Ashwin would with his spin. So when you have to weigh up, oh, would you? Would I rather have Thakur's pace and a bit more batting or, uh, say, two spinners in Jadeja Ashwin? So you, you, lack the play, you lack the pacer, but you get a boost in batting. That's where India have to weigh it up. And so in my opinion, they would pick... At least, they, if not just Ashwin, they would pick Ashwin and Jadeja. And if not Jadeja, they'd pick another batsman. I just, for some reason, I don't see them picking four pacers on that, especially given how important the game it is and how likely India are to collapse. They've had a history of collapses this uh, World Test Championship, and especially against yeah. New Zealand when they went there earlier, they had batting collapses aplenty. So you'd want to strengthen your batting a lot more and make it deeper, so... I believe they'd pick Jadeja at 7 and Ashwin at 8. Uh, but if not that, they'd probably slot Pant at 7 and put another batsman like, say, a Vihari or someone else at number 6 just to boost the batting in some way. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, like I said, I've said this many times. There's, we have a lot of options. There's going to be a lot of... Uh, I mean, I mean, the BCC, I will have to, have to decide at the end. So... Uh, yeah, the squad will, will be interesting to see when it comes out. Yeah. So that has been it for this episode. Uh, it has uh, concluded. We, we first uh, talked about um, just comparing uh, Kohli, Williamson, uh, Rohit, Latham, then all the uh, bowlers, of course. And uh, yeah, and talked about Southampton as well. Uh, overall, I think it, it's uh, going to be a good match. Our next episode will be after the 
uh, uh, WTC finals. So yeah, I mean, yeah. looking forward to that. I'm I'm obviously gonna watch it, of course. But the uh, might be like a five hour episode. <laughs> I mean, yeah, the, I'm sure there'll be a lot to talk about in that. Well, regardless of the result, I mean, depends on what mood you see me come by in the in the next podcast. You'll probably um, like be given away the result, but. Uh, besides, it is like you said, it is a extremely fair matchup, and it is an important matchup. It's uh, like uh, it's the first competition of its kind, the World Test Championship Final. So whoever wins this will be remembered in history. And uh, India, who have been uh, the best Test team for I think like five or six years now, and New Zealand, who have gone through a rapid rise to come go to the top of the Test rankings in the space of only like two or three years, but they've been dominating in every field since then. So it's a perfect clash of titans, and uh, I'm looking forward to it. It's bound to be really, really exciting. Yeah. Well, yeah, uh, that's about it uh, for this episode. Hopefully by the next one we'll have a name. If you have a name, drop in the comments below, because we're not that great at thinking of a, of a name. <laughs> All the good names are taken. I've, I've looked at, like, a Golden Ducks, uh, which is a We Cricket <laughs> podcast, and that's like... Well, a perfectly good name why can't you let me have it I've, I've thought of names like you know positions on the cricket field so like you have third man fine leg and then you can't call a podcast fine leg because it's just it's kind of weird isn't it? it's just, yeah the people who don't know cricket will be like what fine, yeah, fine leg, leg. Fine, really, really, okay. but yeah i mean if you do have yeah i mean yeah, have, if you ha- have a name comment it below uh but that's it from us for now hopefully we'll have a name by next time but till then that has been the cricket podcast with no name Take care, keep your eyes peeled, watch the World Test Championship final and see ya.